In the last lecture, we discussed the principles of conservation planning. Now we're going to look at more real-world examples of conservation planning and just see that the situation is often much more complicated. And in particular, the last example we looked at had just eight sites with 10 features. We also had very simple objectives. In the last example, we just wanted to get uh, one example of every site and the cost of every site was the same. We assumed it was just one or the same amount of money. In real world examples, the objectives that we're trying to achieve are much more complicated. For example, the cost of every site is going to be different and so we need to minimise that overall cost. And secondly, our constraints won't be just to get one example of every site but we might want, for example, 20% 20, 20 of a habitat type, or we want to, might want to have 300 individuals of, say, a species like the dugong. So now our obje objectives are much more complicated. The matrix isn't just zeros and ones. It's going to have a, a lot of other numbers in it. So let's have a look at the situation of applying these principles in the real world to the Great Barrier Reef. Before 2004, only 5% of the Great Barrier Reef was conserved in no-take areas. In the mid-1990s, uh, Senator Robert Hill, who was the Environment Minister of the time, set the objective of building a systematic marine protected area system for all of Australia, and he started pushing the agenda for the Great Barrier Reef in the late 1990s. It took a long time to do, but by 2004, there was a completely new marine protected area system and was built using the principles we've discussed. The first thing they had to do was work out what were the key features. Scientists, ecologists, uh, determined that they could divide the Great Barrier Reef into 70 bioregions, 30 reef bioregions and 40 non-reef bioregions. And here they are illustrated on the map. They also had a lot of other features like where turtles breed, where sea seabirds breed, in particular iconic habitat types like seagrass. On top of that, they placed a grid. It was much finer than this grid. In fact, they divided the entire Great Barrier Reef up into 17,000 different sites. So now imagine the situation not where we have eight sites and 10 features, but we have 17,000 sites, and we have, in fact, 250 features. Each of those sites has a very different cost depending on recreational, commercial, and other uses. So our problem is much larger. In fact, the number of potential solutions to this problem is larger than the number of protons in the entire universe. So this is where our software, MarkSan, was used to build the reserve system and advise the reserve system for the federal government. When we now look at the Great Barrier Reef rezoning, this is the kind of maps that you can get off the internet. This shows you which parts of the reef can be used for which purposes. The areas we've been talking about are in fact the green and the pink zones. These are complete no-take protected areas. Uh, the pale blue is areas where you can basically do any use other than mining. But you'll also notice they're different colours on the map. And it's not just areas that are completely protected and areas that are unprotected. We have, for example, the yellow areas. They are areas where there can be recreational fishing but no commercial fishing. So in fact, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park consists of seven kinds of different zones, each of which has different uses. How are we going to plan for that in marine protected areas? How do we achieve those goals? Let's have a look at an example from a developing country. This is a, an area that's west of the island of New Guinea. Uh, it's the Raja Ampat area, a series of islands with arguably the greatest marine biodiversity in the world, areas where there may be well over uh, 2,000 different species of fish and several hundred species of coral. These islands are areas where Conservation International, the Nature Conservancy and the local community and the government got together and decided to build a protected area system. And here's five parts of that protected areas. Each of those areas were places where the community agreed they would have some marine protected areas. However, it wasn't just that simple. It wasn't just a matter of having places where you couldn't fish. The local community, represented by villagers that live on all those islands, also wanted to have their fishing areas protected from external influences, commercial fishers that are coming from outside the region. So they wanted not just two zones, protected areas and non-protected areas, but they wanted three zones. And they're represented by the three colours on the map. The red zone, in fact, is the colour they preferred for the places where they couldn't go, which are the no-take marine protected areas, and they were designed in a normal way. The green areas, however, are places where the local community can fish 
and different local communities could fish in different parts of those green areas. In fact, there were about 20 different communities who had particular places they needed to fish. And the computer software MarkSan was used to ensure that at least 80% of their former fishing zones were now places they could still fish and were not open to external uses and were not in protected areas. So this is an example of us trying to have our cake and eat it too. We're achieving conservation outcomes, but we're also achieving socioeconomic outcomes for the local community. Another factor that we must consider when we're building protected area systems is there are catastrophes, bad things happen, and th marine protected areas don't stop some things. They can't stop coral bleaching, they st can't stop hurricanes. So while they can stop threats like fishing, there's other things we can't control. The map on the left shows a little bit of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park and the different colours reflect the probability of coral bleaching. The redder areas are places that are highly likely to be bleached in the future according to scientific analyses. The bluer areas, the cooler areas, are less likely to be affected by coral bleaching. What we can do is accommodate that in our protected area design and preferentially choose those areas that are less likely to be hit by these catastrophes like coal bleaching. And on the right you see when we incorporate those areas, the, that, that issue of catastrophes, then certain sites, for example the green sites at the top, become preferentially selected over the redder or more orange sites which now we would prefer not to protect because they're more likely to be hit by catastrophes. And finally, Let's return to the issue of connectivity and clumping. Uh, we have a potential set of sites that could be put in a marine protected area. We would meet our representation goals and we would often find we would end up with a reserve system that was quite scattered. These systems, which although they may be efficient and representative and adequate, uh, are hardly manageable from the perspective of policing those areas and telling people where they are. So the, first, the next thing we want to do is try and clump those areas. So we can do that and still achieve our efficiency and representation objectives uh, in a much more clumped system. So now we have just three reserves still representing all the features. But then we often know that maybe this isn't a well-connected system. So if we were to know the prevailing uh, system of marine currents in the areas, and this might be the current system that typically occurs, you would see that many of the larvae and the eggs that are produced in particular marine protected areas would flow out of those systems. So we're not going to have adequacy. We're not going to have a long-term marine protected area system because the larvae that are produced in some areas don't go to places where they can live and survive. So the next step would be to make a system that isn't just clumped but is also connected. And here we can have our cake and eat it to again a clumped protected area system that is connected through the flow of the currents. So that ends our discussion of the fundamental principles of conservation planning and shows how that they can be applied and are being applied all around the world to design marine protected areas.